basically Carlos Tevez was warming up on the sideline and then he's gone and told Tevez to warm up again and, and then Mancini basically emotional waved his arms and then there was going back and forth effing and jeffing between each other <laughs> and Mancini said you will never play for me ever again if we don't have Tevez we're not going to win the league I suppose, chaps, we should start um, at Old Trafford. The game, um, we, we're recording this just after the game. Um, it was pretty good, wasn't it? No, it was a really good game, wasn't it? It was entertaining. I thought Spurs were excellent again, even though they leave gaps at the back at times. And as a defender, you're watching it, you're thinking, it doesn't quite sit right with me when Ndoggi's coming really inside and Pedro Porro's going really advanced in position to lead themselves a little bit exposed, but it just works for them. Everyone buys into what they're doing. Got really good quality. Without Madison and Son, who would have thought, let's see how they do at Old Trafford. I thought they played an amazing game. Yeah, I thought I thought they were all right. I think they're work in progress. I'm not sure sometimes what you're going to get from them. I thought Rashford was better. Hoyland got his goal again. Great finish. Um but yeah, I don't know. There's, they're they're a long way off Man United, aren't they? There's, they've still got lots to do. I thought Spurs played really well. They're just, they're just going to be fun to watch, aren't they, Spurs? I think that that's when you look at who they've got missing as well. I mean, injuries and players away on international duty, etc. So um, yeah, I thought Spurs played really well. Man United not so not so great, no. Yeah, why doesn't it sit very well with you, the, the defensive minded? Micah. At times on transition for Man United, there was times where I thought Rashford did really well. If some of his touches would have been better today, he could have got in a little bit more. I thought Pedro Porro did really well offensively, but defensively, because he's always in advanced position, he leaves himself a little bit exposed. All his energy is getting used to go forward. So I think today he got he got away with it, and that's obviously the best part of his game. He can play fullback, he can play wing back, he can play winger as well. Really advanced, and it suits the way he wants to play, especially in this team. But I just think you leave yourself exposed. It helped that they've got Van der Ven and Romero back in the partnership, and the pace of Van der Ven was just unbelievable at times on that recovery run. But I just mean when you're trying to set up, you're at Old Trafford, and the game's so open, and your fullbacks out of position, it's really hard for the centre-half to get a, a grip and control of the game. They're playing to the manager's instructions, though, clearly, because that's obviously what he wants. I thought Porro was exceptional. I oh. mean, he's, he's passing, he's crossing, his deliveries, his set plays, every corner was... I mean, they had a lot of corners, a lot of free kicks, and he, you know, he was hitting the right spot pretty much every time. Um, I think... Well, I was talking... I was watching the game with, my, um, with three of my boys, and... Um, uh, we were saying really that I mean it was such a it's such a brave way to play and such an enjoyable way to play that um, you know you can see what he wants to do. They've got a plan. Whereas Man United, as we, we've said so many times, you know you're not sure w what their plan is. I mean they they seem to have become more or less a, a, a counter attacking side. And don't you and, think they've been like that for a long time though, guys? I know, but I'm just you know we know how Manchester City play. We know how Liverpool play. Um, we can now see how Tottenham play. We know what Arsenal do. But with Man United, it, it seems to change depending on who the opposition is. And I think if you're going to win titles and stuff like that, that's I, I'm, I'm not sure that's going to work. You say Porro did really well. I think when you look at the two goals that Spurs conceded, they both come from down that side. Um, so it's all right him attacking and looking great and forward positions and putting great balls in. I think defensively, then that's where both their Man United's goals came from. So that would be the... I just think for the neutral, they're going to be fun to watch and pretty easy to analyse. But Postacoglu's clearly happy with... That's what he wants from them. So, you know, they are going to concede in spaces behind them uh, on occasions. And, and I, I imagine he's saying to them, well, that's, you know, that's part of it. It's fine. I think the positives outweigh the negatives and on we go. But Kevin Keegan's philosophy, we're going to outscore you. We're not going to change. We're going to be on the front foot all the time, home and away. And it's something very similar with Spurs. It's refreshing, I think. It was really good. It was good to see Werner back as well, wasn't it? I mean, I think he's one player who will relish in this system. Pressing high, he makes really good runs from that left-hand side. 
from out to in. And yes, we know he's not the most potent in front of goal or clinical, but he adds something to this Spurs squad in terms of energy and he's got that pace on a counter-attack. I thought Johnson got in some really good positions today, but squandered a few mm. crosses on that right-hand side. But the eagerness from all of them as a squad, it, like, like Gary said, it is, it is brilliant for us to watch. It's just... How far can this take them? Well, they did well against Man City, though, didn't they? Y yes, but they the can't always play that way. They need a plan B as well. So it's great to watch, but they will get picked off against the top, top sides. Their recruitment's been good, though, Tottenham, hasn't it, in the last couple of years, when you <sighs> consider the amount of players that they've brought in and, and where they were. I mean... I think most of us were saying at the start of the season, a new manager coming in, um, obviously did brilliantly in Scotland. The signings that they've brought in um, under Postacoglu. And you have to say, you know, two or three of the signings before he came um, that perhaps didn't look that great um, last season um, because obviously they were in a bit of a rut under Conte and playing a totally different uh, style of football, far more defensive and counter-attacking. They've signed some really good players. I mean, Madison's still out. Uh, you mentioned Van der Ven, the doggy. Um, yeah, I think uh, I've been impressed with them and I think they'll be there or thereabouts to get into, I don't know, fourth or fifth. I think the the most impressive thing for me for Spurs is, like you said there, Gary, with Conte, playing a certain way and then being able to adapt to what the manager wants so quickly. And it's one thing saying it and it's another thing doing it. So when Ten Hag did okay at Man United, we're thinking, okay, what can they do this season? Can they step it up? And Spurs were so far off it for what they had in terms of talent to what they're showing now. And that's down and stems from the manager. So yeah, they've, they've been brilliant to watch. They really are. Manchester United could have pinched it at the end, couldn't they? Mocked McTominay should, should have. Um, <sighs> nodded that one in and then big chance wasn't it what what an opportunity that was to go and go and win the game um you know what I thought was really good today but not not really on the ball off the ball I thought Fernandez's attitude was was brilliant there was certain times where Spurs were on that counter attack and he was running back he was leading by example and I just thought his all round attitude today was was excellent mm. to be honest I know we've seen him he's always very creative, one of the best creators in the league. I think when we talk about Fernandez, sometimes he gets a little bit emotional. So sometimes the the quality in his game we don't really talk about, but he still sets up opportunities. But it was his work rate that shone for me today. I mean, he's very, he's very talented. Isn't oh, he? he's a, yeah, he's class. He's a class player. I mean, he's he's, he's got a lot going for him. Um, you know, as you said, he can he can lose the plot occasionally. I think. If things are not if things are not going well, I think it's a matter of weight with Man United again because of the takeover and Sir Jim Radcliffe and what he's going to do and how is it going to affect or not affect the team going forward. Um, how is twenty five percent stakes going to work? I think it's just a matter of looking at it, waiting and watching and 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 see because still on the pitch they're they're a long way off. Do you think though? I'd, I'd like to ask you two a question. You're top strikers in your eras and we talk everyone talks about recruitment if you was Alan Shearer but in today's game would you go to to Man United right now because we talk about recruitment but are the best players still gonna go to Man United with the amount of players who have gone there and it's not worked Micah, out he didn't go to Manchester United when they were really good <laughs> 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 oh, this, that is very yeah. true yeah I think despite I don't know how I wouldn't say how poor how average they are on the pitch they're still a mite of a football club mm. aren't they so they're still they're always going to attract uh, top players um, but are they going to attract the very best sometimes when you when you're a player you, you, you look at going to a club and they're not quite at the top level, you might think to yourself, if your ego is big enough, I can be the one that makes the difference. You know, if someone went to Manchester United now and galvanised the club, and you know, someone's banging in loads of goals, you know, you can make a real difference, and you'll get so much credit for that for improving their performance. You look at the likes of Pogba, what he was doing at Juventus, and I was in the league, Serie A, when he was there. 
And I thought, oh my God, Man United have got phenomenal player, which he is. It didn't quite work out. Then you go and get Sancho from Dortmund, who was ripping the league. Yes, it's not as strong as the Premier League. We know that. But I always gauge it from the Champions League. It's the same with Anthony. They spent what, 80 million on him. And when he was playing in the Champions League for Ajax, he looked like a right player. So you look at all these players that go there and you think, do I want to risk two or three years of my career now not knowing? Would you wait until the potentially at that stage where they look like they're competing before you make that big decision to go there? No, it's a very valid point. And, and, and players want to go, you know, the big players want to go to clubs where they're guaranteed Champions League football. Uh, mm -hmm. And they're going to be pursuing trophies and, and in the mix constantly. It's a situation where we have to sit and wait and see what's going to happen with, with Man United. How much are they going to spend? How is it going to work with it, him taking control of the football side of things? And I don't know, sometimes you always have a new guy in there and he wants his own man to go in. I don't know, there's, there's so much to talk about with Man United and has been for years. There's no quick fix, is there? What, whatever they do. Not because also they've got to make judgments about players now he might have loads of money but he's not going to you know know necessarily about football i'm sure like he has in his businesses he brings in the right sort of people um but you know there's no <laughs> football's different to business in in many ways isn't it certainly on the on the playing side of things you know there's no guarantee Very different. as you said mike as some of the players that they've signed you'd you'd think they were absolute bankers but it's not quite uh, worked out for them. Um, interesting. You mentioned um, Jaden Sancho, and he's, he's gone obviously to Borussia Dortmund, <laughs> and um, immediately had an assist, didn't he? So I was pleased <laughs> for him actually because it, it, people be critical of him and they'll say this and that. We, d you know, we don't know all the truths. And this. I think it was best for both parties that he got out with Old Trafford because there was a wedge between him and the manager. The manager had his point. The player had his point. Um, they weren't prepared to meet in the middle. So something had to give. So he best off out of the football club and get out and playing football because he'd been. I mean, as we keep saying, if if you get if you get fifteen years in football, you've been really mm. lucky. So to sit around on your ass, not not because of an injury, not because of it, because of an argument with a the manager, then it's far too long. So he needs to, he needed to get out and he needs to start playing football again. And good to see him back. Um, and good to see him coming on with an assist, but. Um, he's got a. I mean, he's lost what five or six months of of, of football, so that's not going to be easy to get back in the swing of things. Did you see what the um, Dortmund CEO Hans Joachim Watzke said? Um, he said Jaden doesn't have any discipline problems at all. I don't know who keeps saying that. Jaden only has one problem: he occasionally arrives late. He's a very nice guy, but occasionally he was late. But you have to deal with it. So he does have disciplinary problems then. <laughs> <laughs> Alan, you are a stickler well, uh, for punctuality. Well, I mean, do you know, I, I just can't understand the timing and being, and being late. It's so disrespectful. When you've got 20 or 25 other people that, I don't know, sat waiting to go out training or sat waiting on a bus waiting to leave, what and we should just accept you being I mean once okay fine there might be a valid reason but when it happens multiple times that's not acceptable no way why should everyone sit and wait for you how do you deal with that I mean how do you put up with it you give someone an ultimatum I mean I, I get that you, it's very difficult nowadays to treat every single player exactly the same but I think the one thing that has to be is timing no yeah, I, I agree. I, with timing, I'm with Alan on this. I'm never late. Um, but in, in terms of treating everybody the same, I, I, I don't re I wouldn't go with that notion only because... Well, even in punctuality, even being late. No, late, I agree with that. I agree with that. But in terms of different characters for different yeah, get, people, yeah, yeah. you yeah. give certain players a leeway. So when we won the league in 2012... We had some characters. We had Yaya Torre, who just come from Barcelona. We had Balotelli, who we all know what Balotelli is like. And we had Tevez. And Tevez was, was so quiet, worked really hard in training, didn't really interact with off the field sort of activities, just did his own thing. But do you remember the game against Bayern Munich in the Champions League? Basically, Carlos Tevez was warming up on the sideline and he's warming up for five, 10 minutes, ready to go on. 
Mancini was going to make a sub, change his mind, and Carlos is basically sat back down on the bench, ready to come on. And then he's gone and told Tevez to warm up again. And Tevez has basically said, no, I'm, I'm, I'm fine. I'm, I'm ready to go now if you want to make the sub. And then Mancini basically, emotional, waved his arms. And then there was going back and forth, effing and jeffing between each other. <laughs> we, we got to the, the dressing room afterwards and Mancini said, you will never play for me ever again. Wow, that's it. Tevez, do you remember that period where Tevez went away for, he went on a golf trip. He was a caddy for his mate. Alan Shearer. Somewhere in the world, he was pictured <laughs> on the golf course during the season. We're fighting for our lives. Yaya Torre is going to African nations. So we're losing Tevez and we're losing Yaya Torre. And then basically we got together as a group and said, we need Tevez. Mancini was not having it. He said, no chance. But I said, boss, if, if we don't have Tevez, we're not, we're not going to win the league. Tevez comes back first game, scores an hat trick. If he doesn't come back from their disagreement, then we don't win the league. We won the league that year on goal difference. That's how tight it was. So I always think, yes, I agree with standards. You should always have standards. I agree with Alan, you should always be on time. But everyone needs to be treated differently, I would say, to get the best out of them, especially when they're so vital towards a team. I think famously Sir Alex Ferguson treated Cantona very differently. Um, according, well, even to himself, he said he, you know, he was a maverick, but he recognised how important he was um, for the team. So I think, you know, you, you might make exceptions against your rules for the truly exceptional footballer. I agree. I totally, totally, totally agree with that. I mean, in terms of dress or there's, you can get away with that. But I think the one thing you can't get away with is a player constantly being late for training or for matches or for whatever. Bobby Robson used to say, didn't he? Late for a tackle, son. You cost me my fucking job. <laughs> he did used to say that. Do you think there's an element, though, perhaps that Ten Hag had the tendency to to go public um, with his with his criticisms? Ten Hag was brought in because of the lack of discipline in that football club. He was brought in to sort things out. So you can't then have a go at him because he wants to discipline someone because of a whatever a bad attitude or being late or whatever it is. But should that be kept in the dressing room, Alan? Uh, yeah, yeah. Every, everything should be kept in the uh, in in the dressing room. Nothing should you should you should never really as a manager. Uh, and 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 you've only ever seen it, I think, and when the, it's a last resort for a manager to 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 try and say, look, this is you've got one chance, last chance saloon. Um, if you tried every single other thing and then that's not worked, then I, I, I guess that's why he did that. The dressing room went against him with the whole Ronaldo thing, early doors. Do you remember when they went home early from a pre-season game? Mm -hmm. Ronaldo went home at half time. Yeah. And that was always going to be a big problem for them. Then we had the incident where Rashford turned up late. He told the press about that as well. And then let's, for a bit of context, a bit of balance, the um, Ten Hag actually protected Sancho at one point. You remember when he said he, he he wasn't in the right frame of mind to play? So he has protected him. So he must have just been at the end of his tether. Something's happened. Sancho doesn't want to apologise. And he said, okay, you're not playing for me. The problem with that is because of the scrutiny on Man United, where it become, a little problem has become a massive problem because of how big the football club is. And his mistake is bringing everything into the public eye. He should deal with that, like Alan said, in the dressing room. You never hear from, you, you never ever, I mean, and you know that he's a hard taskmaster, someone like Pep, um, someone like Jurgen Klopp too. You, but you never ever hear them criticise their, whatever's gone on, it's dealt with behind closed doors. Mm -hmm. At City, they've been really successful. So all the power is with well, the manager. Always helps. Always helps. At Liverpool, yeah. they've been really successful. So all the power is with the manager. If one player messes around, then it's it's up to the squad as well to jump on that on that uh, on that player for whatever for whatever reason. But Liverpool can can kick someone out. Man City can leave. You can just leave them out because if you the likelihood is you're going to carry on winning. And you, you know is, is that when you're winning, then nothing gets questioned. 
But as soon as you start losing games, then the issues start to, to happen. It's a very valid point. And on that point, we'll take a little break. Cracking game at Newcastle. Uh, sorry to bring it up, Alan. Uh, must have been a painful <laughs> one for you. But, but what a game of football, wasn't it? It was a brilliant game of football. Um, it had to be spoiled by the genius of Kevin De Bruyne, oh. didn't it? I mean, oh, do you know, sometimes, you know, I mean, I was obviously really pissed off with them scoring <laughs> to, at, the, at the end. But sometimes you've just got to sit and applaud someone when they're that good. I mean... It was it was twenty one mm. minutes of yeah. genius, wasn't it? The way he just come on and grabbed the game by the scruff of the neck. It was if it was if he's never been away. It was it was if to say and you could see everyone sort of all his teammates think, here we go, look at him, just get the ball mm. to him, and he just came on, got the ball, and he absolutely bossed it. And the way he found himself in the space, and then to do the keeper the way he did and put it through the defender's legs, and then that. Oh, I mean, God, that, I mean, the pass, Jesus mm. Christ. It was absolutely perfect. Oh. That was one difficult ball as well. I hate you, Kevin De Bruyne! <laughs> <laughs> I've got a question for you, though, Gaz, because you, you get to ask us pundits, me and Alan and whoever you're working with all the time. And you've heard our opinions on this many times, but would he be... Up there is the greatest ever Premier League midfielder, oh. in your opinion. I think he's rubbish. <laughs> <laughs> no, I, well, he, he'll be one of them. I mean, uh, uh, he, there are plenty of them, aren't they? All right, I'll give you... We've got Gerrard, Lampard, Scholes. Vieira, Keane. Yeah, I mean, and they're all different kinds of players as well, aren't they? But out of all of those, he's probably, possibly the most versatile in the sense that, you know, mm. he, he could play pretty much any role. Um, he could play wide. Um, he could play as a 10. He could play, like, deeper role. Um, his, his passing range. Um, he's a wonderful player. He'd, he'd, he'd certainly be up there. I mean, um, and, and I think over the period of time, and I think when we did the top 10 um, midfield players on the um, top 10 podcast that we do, um, I, it was probably two or three years ago when we did that one and um, he would have improved his, his his standing even though he's been out for, for half of this season but he's, he's right up there with those players and they're all truly great players is that a bit of a fudge or so can you get off, can you get off that uh, fence please what, what have we got some of that cream what do you call <laughs> it again creosote Mike I remember <laughs> That cream. <laughs> no, I'm, I, I, I gently... Who's your favourite then? Okay, it doesn't have to be the best. Who's your favourite? If you had to pick one, one, just one oh. midfielder who could do absolutely everything. Gerard could do absolutely everything. Oh, yeah. Gerard was always my favourite. Lampard is more of a goal scorer, but he was also a, a great player. Paul Scholes, I mean, you'd love to play with him. His passing range was, was beautiful, um, incredible. Um, I'd probably vie away from the kind of aggressive holding up and down midfield players in, in this sense. So Keane and Vieira, because, I, I, but they, I mean, they're so, they, I mean, they're such great players. But, um, but I, you know, but De Bruyne is, you know, be right up there. It, I always judge it by perhaps the player you'd really want to play with. And I think as a striker, then yeah, I was just about De Bruyne and, and, and Scholes, yeah. because their passing ability. Um, but wouldn't mind playing with any of them, really. I played with Glenn Hoddle for a while for, with, with England a few times, and that, that was an absolute treat um, because his passing range was truly extraordinary. Um, but De Bruyne's delivery, whether it's from crosses or the ball that he hit, for example, for Oscar Bob's goal um, yesterday, oh. was um, absolutely... <laughs> He, he is so good, isn't he? He really is. I would normally say it was great to watch, but it wasn't. How would you have answered that question? My my number one has always been Steven Gerrard. Um, I just think he had absolutely everything and played in teams which weren't potentially as great as mm -hmm. the others. And he was always the key man. To get to two Champions League finals, uh, win one of them and lose one of them, but be a key man in getting him there. And I know he didn't win the league, and we're talking about Premier League, but just his consistency, he would be my number one. I think by the time Kevin De Bruyne has finished his career, I 
think he, he might just overtake him. It was hard enough question when it used to be just Skulls, Lampard and Gerrard, wasn't it? But Gerard, if, if yeah. you include <laughs> other players, Oscar Bob's going to be a player, isn't he? Ooh, I did tell you about him. You did? I did tell you about him. Remember in the League Cup, he played up at uh, Newcastle, wasn't it? Yeah. Best, best player on the pitch that day. And he's just so effortless. Another one, you know, that, that we've talked about losing the lights of Cole Palmer to, to Chelsea and he's been brilliant. But then you've just got another one just ready to come in and make the difference. And the celebrations were good as well, I thought, from City. We discussed that on uh, mm. Saturday night on Match of the Day as well. It's just Pep and De Bruyne, the whole squad celebrating with the fans. It felt as if it was a big win for them, didn't it? I mean, It uh, just it, felt like a it? turning point, yeah. didn't it? Psychologically, for some reason, like, you know, it's difficult to go to Newcastle and they can, they played very well. I thought it was excellent, Newcastle. They need a turning point, Manchester City, because they've really struggled the last few years. <laughs> <laughs> Newcastle, however, Alan, have lost seven of their last 10 Premier League games. What's the mood like uh, up there? Yesterday would have been a great example of being able to change it in the last half an hour because the, the players that were there yesterday were running on empty and it, it, needed, it needed some fresh legs on there. Normally, with, with, you'd have Willick, uh, Harvey Barnes, uh, Callum Wilson. Uh, I mean, they've got so many, uh, so many injuries. It's, just, it's incredible. There's, um, there's no panic. Um, it is what it is. They, I thought they played really well. They tried to nick the point by sitting back, but it's a difficult thing to do when you're always going to be up against it with a class. I still think they might get into fifth or sixth. Ooh, still confident. I like, that. I like that optimism, Alan. Um, I watched the um, Everton and, 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 and Villa game um, today. It was obviously a stalemate, no goals at, at Goodison. Um, and Villa missed the chance to go joint top of the table with Liverpool. Um, did you notice that first goalless draw uh, in Unai Emery's 97 top flight games with Arsenal and Aston Villa? And I saw that at the end, yeah, it was unbelievable, wasn't it? Incredible stat. There's a, a, it wasn't a, a great game though, was it? VAR had an interesting day. I mean, it took them about five minutes to work the, the offside. But why are they looking at the offside? I, I, I'm, I'm watching the game, losing my marbles. Like, why? It's a foul! On, on uh, Dan Juma, it's a foul anyway. The only reason he's in that position is because he's being fouled. So I don't understand why they're looking at the offside. It was a foul anyway. And it took three and, and a half minutes or whatever it was to, to come to that conclusion. It's just getting frustrating. And I feel like as a, when we talk about VAR, I, I never want to put VAR away. I, I, I never do because they're just trying to do the oh. job. They're trying to make the game better, but they're just taking too no, long now. I no. agree. It should never, ever have taken that long. I mean, no. it was ridiculous the amount of time it took. Maybe they're getting a bit panicky in case they get it wrong or something yeah. like that, um, possibly. Um, was it a penalty, do you think? Yeah. I thought so as well. I thought it was blatant penalty. If not once, twice. What did you think of the decision on Friday evening? Burnley against Luton. Last minute, the foul on the goalkeeper. <laughs> we discussed it last night on Match of the Day, Alan, and um, I, I thought it was a foul. Michael thought it was a foul. Whether it was an absolute clear and obvious error, you could argue. I thought he rammed his hip right into him. But um, um, Glenn Murray last night made his, um, his, his debut and, and he didn't think it was a foul. And I know that, that you didn't, Al, as well, because you mentioned it in our, our group chat. And we actually, he, I think he said, I wonder what Alan Shearer would make of it. And I said, he knew already that I'd told him that it was... A well, he called you Big Al. I, I didn't know he was on them terms, if I was being totally honest. I was amazed that, one, the referee didn't give the foul, and two, VAR didn't give the foul, because history tells you as soon as you touch a goalkeeper, that's it. Done. Foul. That keeper is yeah. not very good on crosses, and I think he realised that, oh, shit, I'm not getting to this, and I've got to turn this into, or try and turn it into a foul. So um, no, I'm, I wasn't. I wasn't having it. It was a foul, no. Well, we 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 thought it was a foul, didn't we, Micah? We we yeah we, yeah we we agreed it was a foul. Chelsea had a, a much needed win. Um, Cole Palmer slotted um, home another penalty um, after he obviously missed one or two chances in in midweek in the Carabao Cup. Um, three league wins in a row now for Chelsea. They're looking a little bit more. What's the word? A little bit more. 
dogged in in their style. They're still struggling to 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 bang in their goals, but there were some um, one or two good performances. Um, we highlighted Cole Palmer and, and Connor Gallagher, whose numbers are really good this season, um, and he's got. A, a tremendous energy to his game. That wasn't a, that wasn't a great game either. It, I mean, both teams I thought were were pretty average. Um, but another win for Chelsea can only do their confidence the world of good. Uh, I still think they're miles away from where they want to be, and it's going to take a long time. <laughs> what are you giggling at? Well, you disagree uh, with that, do you? No, I don't. I know. I, I I agree with what you're saying, but I I, I just think. It was looking very, very bleak. It's a little bit more positive for them to to, mm -hmm. to get them wins. Um, me, Glenn, and, and Gary was speaking yesterday. I, um, in terms of the positioning of the midfield and not having Cole Palmer in the ten, he played out wide. Uh, Colin Gallagher played sort of as that number ten, and he does all the good work in terms of the pressing. But you know, in the tight spaces, that's not really his role but he's more of a number eight where he can arrive in the box. You remember when he was at Crystal Palace where he was just, he was just everywhere. The energy was brilliant, arriving, scoring goals. But sometimes I feel like on the ball, he's a little bit isolated in there. I think Enzo and Cassiedo in the midfield don't really know who's doing what. Is one staying? Is one going? Is it worth dropping one of them and then bringing... Connie Gallagher a little bit back, but don't forget they've still got Lavia as well, who's a defensive midfielder. So where does he fit into the team? Who's Cassiedo, by the way? <laughs> oh, how do you pronounce it? Uh, Saicedo? How, how do you pronounce it, guys? <laughs> Caicedo. Caicedo. Oh, no, it's because we had a, we, when we had a, um, a Cassiedo at Man City, I asked him how he said, he said Cassiedo. Well, it depends how it's spelled. It's, it's spelled the same. <laughs> Is it? <laughs> Look it up. Hey, hey, Johnny, you need to back me up on this. Cassiano, that's not this Cassiano. They're Googling as we speak. Yes, Google. Well, it's Kai Thedo. Ka Kai Thedo. <laughs> well, Kai Thedo. <laughs> Kai Thedo. Thedo. <laughs> He's got some future, that Cassiano, I tell you. <laughs> Micah. It is it is spelt the same. It is spelt the same. And the one who told me how to say his name, Castiedo. You calling him the wrong name for all the time that you're with him. <laughs> <laughs> I want to finish this podcast um, talking about the goings on at um, Reading and the protests there and the game was abandoned. Let me uh, give a quick explainer for perhaps those that don't know. Um, the game against Port Vale was abandoned in the 16th minute after well, hundreds of fans um, invaded the pitch. Um, the fans are actually protesting at the ownership of uh, Dai Yonge. Um, they desperately want him out. Um, Reading have been docked 16 points since um, November 2021 under his ownership. They were relegated to League One last season, falling out of England's top two tiers for the first time since 2002. Uh, currently in the relegation zone and three points from safety. Um, the fans have, have, have gone on the pitch. Um, they made a statement saying, we know we'll get punished by the FL for this, but we feel desperate. Um, you know, I suppose perhaps an independent regulator when they come in, can they do something uh, about this sort of uh, occurrence? I think he's owned two clubs before um, uh, that have gone to the wall. Um, and obviously the fans are, are seriously worried about that. Um um, credit to the manager, Ruben Sellers, is, uh, for sticking with it. Um, it's, it must be a really difficult position for um, the players, the manager particularly, and, and obviously the supporters. It's their club, you know, it's their club. And, you know, it's, it sets a bit of a precedent invading the pitch and getting a game abandoned. But what do we think of it? Yeah, but they're, they're, they've had enough. They've, they've seen their club relegated. They've seen their club dock points. They've seen other clubs that the owner has had go to the wall um, and they're fearing that's what's going to happen to them. So it's, what, what else can they do? They've got, to, they've got to make their point, their fans. So I'm, I'm, I'm with them. Um, I mean, they're, they're docked points because what? They're not paying their, their mm -hmm. salaries of the football yep. clubs. Um, people uh, are being made redundant, left, right and centre. So I think they're just they're at the end of the tether, the fans. They can't do anything else other than that. So I'm with them. Yeah, it's very difficult nowadays because when clubs are owned by you know one particular person, if if they're not running things properly, there's 
you know, it's it, ultimately it'd be down to him whether he wants to, you know, to sell it or not, or whether he can sell it, or who knows what the position is with and how his interest is in this in this particular, in you know, with Reading. Um, I really do feel that for the supporters, I must. I mean, football football clubs are so important for the communities of towns and cities, aren't they? Yeah, the the massive, and it's it's them who suffer more than anyone. Um, Everyone wants a big fancy owner to take the club forward, but if an owner can't do that, I don't understand why they would be at the club, you know? Some owners do it for the the wrong reasons, do it for for status. I've been in a situation at at Villa where we was going through uh, financial difficulty at a time just before they got taken over. Um, It was Dr. Tony and he was on Twitter every other week. And then I remember speaking to people at the club saying, we don't even know if we've got money to to pay the wages. And the the players are suffering, but it was the people at Villa, I remember at Christmas, and we we had a meeting in the, uh, the canteen and there was basically saying, we don't even know if the staff are gonna get paid us getting paid so much money as footballers. We'll live. We can find another club. We can go about our business. But for them, the people have been there for 20, 30 years, not knowing and not having that uncertainty. It's just wrong. So I agree with Alan. It's power to the people. Go on there and and protest because something needs to give. It can't keep happening. And if you're not prepared to put in the money to run the club how it should be, then don't buy it. It's yeah. as simple as that. As long as they're, you know, peaceful demonstrations, obviously. Um, but of yeah, course, let, of let's course, hope yeah. it. Let's ho- hope it works itself out, and um, let's hope he sells the club, and and they get someone in there can can provide some some stability and uh, a, 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 an optimistic future. Well, that's it for this episode. Um, so goodbye from me. Goodbye from me. Goodbye from me. Have a good week, everyone. <laughs> <laughs>